Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on symbols, figurative language, and theme. So let us dive straight in. Um, worth mentioning before we get too far into this, um, just like with our previous video on plot and character and point of view and setting, um, we are primarily going to be talking about fiction with uh, in, in this video. But uh, especially here, I think we're talking about symbols, we're talking about themes, we're talking about figurative language. This all very much applies to poetry and drama, much in the same way that it does with fiction. Uh, you know, we're still, when we're talking about themes, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same stuff. We're talking about symbols, talking about the same stuff. Anyway, let's dive straight in. Symbols and archetypes. Uh, in a lot of ways, I think the best way for us to think about what a symbol is, is a concrete representation of an abstract idea. So, okay, well, what does that mean? My love is like a red, red rose. Like, okay, well, love is kind of an abstract concept. It's very difficult for us to define exactly what it is, but, you know, we point to, you know, this, this symbol, this, this red, red rose, it's, you know, beautiful and it smells nice. Um, but if you grab it too hard, it'll hurt you. Um, you know, these, these are, you know, ideas that it, it, it it's a way to take an idea and attach a, a, a significance to it. Uh, we see, for instance, toward the end of Flannery O'Connor's A Good Man is Hard to Find, uh, the misfit takes off his glasses and he cleans them before he puts them back on. Um, this very much symbolizes a, uh, a change in perspective. He sees things more clearly now. Um, as far as conventional and contextual symbols are, uh, contextual symbols are symbols that really only have meaning in one particular context. Uh, for instance, a, uh, a, a, a red hand print shaped birthmark on a woman's cheek. This really only has any kind of significance within the context of Nathaniel Hawthorne's short story, The Birthmark. Doesn't, it's, it's, you know, we don't really see that anywhere else. Whereas, you know, that symbol that I, I just mentioned with the misfit of, you know, a character taking off glasses and cleaning them or being unable to find glasses, uh, more often than not in a literary text, if you see somebody fiddling with their glasses, they're taking them off, they can't find them. It symbolizes something related to their perspective. They either can't see things clearly, or with the case of the misfit, he takes them off um, because they're covered in blood and uh, he cleans them. And, and all of a sudden he can see things more clearly. Uh, this is what we would call a conventional symbol. Conventional symbols are things that we've seen a number of times. They generally tend to mean the same thing, no matter where we see them. Archetypes, on the other hand, are they're kind of like conventional symbols, except they go a lot deeper and they come out of what Carl Jung, who's a psychologist, um, uh, calls comes, comes out of what he would call the collective unconscious. Now, the collective unconscious, as opposed to the personal unconscious, you know, the stuff that each each one of us individuals kind of has floating around unknowingly in the back of our minds, the collective unconscious predates all of us as individuals. And it holds everything, every aspect of our history. It holds all of our religious, spiritual, mythological uh, symbols, every pattern of experience. It, you know, everything that, that, that makes humans humans is kind of contained within this collective unconscious and um the ways that it kind of manifests itself the the patterns or the structures that we see coming out of this collective unconscious over and over and over again are called archetypes um and one of the the quickest examples that comes to mind is the quest for the holy grail it's a story that we see over and over and over and over again in any number of different iterations um it's it's just it's something that that we see you know all the time uh the archetype of a great flood would be another um another great example of of that so uh as far as allusion is concerned and, and these are these are these are figurative um source figures of speech here uh first and foremost allusion is not illusion it's not a, a, a you know 
a deception or a, a, a misunderstanding of what something is. It's a brief uh, indirect reference to something with historical, cultural, or literary significance. Um, a great example of this would be to say that like somebody's tilting at windmills. Well, what does that refer to? Uh, well, it refers to Miguel de Cervantes's novel Don Quixote, where the, the main character, Don Quixote, um, he's uh, attacking what he thinks are giants, but they're just windmills. Um, and what that does is it, it tells us that in a kind of foolish, uh, hopeless quest to, to conquer something, that person is still going, going for it. Um, what allusions are, they're, they're writerly shorthand. Um, they're a way to simplify complex ideas and emotions, again, by relying on previous knowledge to, you know, kind of give us a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a shortcut. A lot of references uh, and a lot of allusions tend to come out of Greek mythology or um, or the Christian Bible. And so, uh, you know, for more detailed literary studies, you know, knowing a little something about Greek mythology, knowing a little something about, um, you know, a wide range of Bible stories, it's probably a good idea because you'll probably see them, you know, popping up from time to time. Uh, another figure of speech and and a really common one is metaphor and these are uh they're direct comparisons between two objects that are not like each other um this is not to be confused with simile saying like oh someone's sly as a fox or um someone's you know quick like a bunny these are these are you know they have that word like or as um it's an indirect comparison uh it's not saying someone is something else. Now, metaphors have two parts to them, the tenor and a vehicle. The tenor is the thing that is being compared, and the vehicle is what it's being compared to. So I've got two examples for you here. Uh, John is a pig. John is, in this case, the tenor, and a pig is the vehicle. Is John literally a pig? Well, in this instance, no, he, he's not. He's a person. Um, but what we're saying here is that John, the person, is uh, not the best person in the world. Uh, he's 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 kind of filthy. He's kind of gross. He's not um, not not behaving uh, in a particularly gentlemanly fashion, perhaps. Um, our second example here, America is a melting pot. Uh, is the United States of America literally a melting pot? No, it, 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 it's a country, <laughs> but um, we have this idea of, you know, like so many people from some all over the world and, you know, different belief systems and different structures. We all come together and we, and that's the U.S. Um, that's, that's our, that's our metaphor. Um, uh, over here, I got to get an image of, you know, placing, you know, like brain soup, you know, we're, we're, we're sprinkling in little bits of knowledge, crafting a, a, a stew of learning, which is what's going on right now. I mean, not literally, I'm not making a stew with your brains. Um, <laughs> other types of symbol um, and, and figurative language are allegory and myth. Um, allegory is, uh, it's a complex network of symbols where we have two layers. Uh, we've got the literal layer of like what happens in a story. And then we've got the allegorical or the symbolic layer that happens underneath of that. Uh, there's a lot of one-to-one -one kind of comparisons here. Um, two, uh, two really good examples of allegory. Uh, one is Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, Young Goodman Brown. It tells the story of a literal young good man. Uh, Goodman, in, in this case, is a, uh, it's a, it's a social status, uh, kind of, you know, like re regular average person of good standing. Um, so he's a young good man whose last name happens to be Brown. And uh, in this, he goes into the woods and he he has a walk with someone who might be the devil, but he might not exist. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but he thinks he sees his wife going to like a satanic communion and he proclaims out, ah, oh, my faith is gone. Uh, his wife's name is Faith. And, uh, you know, this, you know, works on, on two, la two layers. Uh, on the literal layer, he's saying, oh, my faith, my wife has left me and now she's 
part of the, the, the Satan cult. Uh, on the symbolic level, this is Goodman Brown kind of admitting that his his faith in God has has left him, and he you know freaks out. And he says, "Come, devil, for to the, uh, sin is but a name. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given." And then he runs screaming through the woods. Um, it's great. You should read it. <laughs> a second example of this is a, a, a medieval play called Pilgrim's Progress, and uh, it follows the the exploits of every man who uh, literally is stands in for every man and he he um comes into contact with characters like death and joy and faith and love and uh, i'll give you three guesses as to what each of these characters symbolize it's a lot more direct um allegories are not always this straightforward uh over here i have a a, a woodcut of albrecht or saint george and the dragon um which uh in addition to being kind of you know like a pervading myth in in a lot of different traditions which we'll get to talk about in a second um the end of edmund spence the first book of edmund spencer's epic poem the fairy queen um concludes with a with a with a you know sequence on saint george and the dragon and the fairy queen is this like hyper complex allegory for um you know the sort of the state of elizabethan england at the end of the uh, of the 15th century it's great it's it's wild um myths uh there, there are kinds of two ways that we can think about myth um on one way we or in one sense we could think of myths as stories that are allegorical on pretty much every level they are designed to kind of teach us something to show us something um and on every level there at every every aspect of this story is designed to represent something else uh in addition to that myths um you know we we use this word to take on stories that have really lasted for an extremely long period of time and something that that's kind of made its way into that collective unconscious that we were talking about earlier on so we've talked about symbols. We've talked about some figures of speech, some ways that symbols get used. Now let's talk theme. What is it all about? So um, I think it's important when we're thinking about theme, it's important for us to remember that themes are not morals. They're not lessons for us to learn. Um, you know, like don't don't be mean to your siblings or always respect your elders. Like that's that's not really what themes are. Uh, they're they're the essential meaning of a literary work. Um, and they they they're they're what a work is about in a lot of ways. And there there can be more than one theme to a text. Uh, you could think about theme also as just like a major idea that a particular author is working with so for instance this could be you know like themes sir like death is a big one uh the idea of nature and the natural world is another big one love um yeah but also things like um oppression um the oppression of women gender roles these these are major themes that uh we'll be diving into um you know they're 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 big ideas so how do you identify theme um i think one of the first places to look is the title of a work uh you know is does the title give you any kind of sense of what it might be about another great uh way to really kind of keep keep your eye out for themes is if there is ever a moment when a narrator or a character they seem to be making like broad general statements about you know the nature of things the way the world is oh, sorry for whacking the microphone um it's probably it's it, they, they might not just be talking about their unique experience there they might be giving you a hint of like oh this is maybe this is something that that the author is trying to tell us something that the that the work is actually about um if there's ever an idea that or or a line or dialogue or you know something that that shows up over and over and over again um that might be a hint for identifying theme uh for instance in stephen crane's short story the open boat uh there's a uh almost kind of a refrain 
something along the lines of like, if I am to drown here, why, oh, why was I allowed to come this far? And that, 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 you know, that line gets repeated like seven times throughout the story. It, it, it gives us a hint as to what Crane might be trying to say about the nature of nature. Anyway, uh, that about wraps this one up. Uh, thank you all very much, and I will see you in the next video.